Hello and welcome to the third installment of my Pokemon Generation 3 ROM hacking series. The focus of this tutorial is to understand how tiles are arranged within their respective groupings and how every map is dependent upon these groupings for displaying a particular set of graphics. Sounds like a mouthful of confusion, I know, but we'll take it step by step. This video will be broken down to the following segments. What are tile sets? What are palettes? How can I add new tile combinations into the game? And how can I assign certain tiles special properties? Following these segments will be an application demonstration. In this final part, we will be constructing a very simple map that contains some new tile combinations than what the original game offers using the skills we've acquired from this tutorial. If you open any map in Advanced Map, you should be able to open the Block Editor window, which is represented by a purple puzzle piece. Starting with the leftmost component, we can see that it contains every usable tile in the current map. We can scroll through the list to see the rest of the tiles that are available. But wait, this looks familiar. Haven't we seen this before? The answer is yes, we have. This column of tiles is the exact same column of tiles that exists in the map view when we're editing our maps. If we hover the cursor over these tiles and move the mouse from left to right and top to bottom, we can see that the number next to the block label becomes greater and greater. This number tells us which tile we're observing in the grouping of tiles. This should make sense and should be easy to understand, it's nothing difficult. The tiles indication numbers increase as we move from row to row all the way to the bottom of the list. The only thing that might be a bit confusing is that Advanced Map likes to call the graphics in this section blocks instead of tiles. There's a good reason for this, so from here on out, whenever we're editing these graphics, I'll be using the term blocks instead of tiles. Other than the list of blocks, there's also the list of tiles. The indication numbers for these tiles works the same way as with the blocks. Going from row to row towards the bottom of the list will increase the number next to the tile label more and more. Note that these tiles are only 8x8 in width and height as opposed to our 16x16 16 blocks, making them one fourth the size of a block. But what are these tiles, and why are they so jumbled and colored weirdly? These tiles are what we use to create the blocks that we can actually place into our maps. They're essentially the stepping stones of our visible blocks. Put them together in whatever order you want, and you can make new blocks. For example, let's click a tree tip in the block section. We can see that the area under the down up label is filled with grass and the tip of a tree with a black background, respectively. If you're hacking emerald, you'll see a dark blue background, but it doesn't really make a difference since the mechanics of what's going on are the exact same throughout all Gen 3 games. This down up area is where we can see and edit how our blocks look in our maps. The up section shows us which tiles are being used to create the tip of the tree, while the down section shows us which tiles are being used to create the grass that lies behind or underneath the tip of the tree. This makes it sound like every block has the potential to be made out of two different layers of tile, which is true. Whenever we have some tiles that rely on other tiles to lie underneath them to look nice, we place the superior tiles in the up section and the inferior tiles in the down section. If you click on some of the blocks, you'll be able to see this pretty quickly. For example, the signpost has a superior signpost and an inferior grass. The ocean boulder has a superior boulder and an inferior water. As we scroll through these examples, you should have picked up on something. The superior tiles always seem to have some designated color for transparency so the inferior tiles can be shown beneath them. In the cases I showed you, this transparent color was black. If we turn our attention to the list of tiles, we can see that some of them have the transparency color and some of them actually have things like grass along with them. Any tile that doesn't have any of this transparent color is probably going to be used in the down section, and any tile that has this transparency color is probably going to be used in the up section. If we look at the grass in the list of tiles, we can see that it doesn't incorporate any of the transparent color in its design. Now if we click on it in the block section, we can see that the entire up section is black, meaning this block doesn't have any superior tiles. Another important detail to note is that the four tiles assigned to the up section allow the player to pass underneath them. Take the tip of the tree for example. If we load up the game and walk into the tip of the tree, our player will appear to be underneath the tip of the tree and on top of the grass. In other words, the player appears below the superior tiles and above the inferior tiles. It works the same way with things like roofs and mailboxes. The roof and mailbox are in the up sections while the grass is in the down sections. Got all of that? It's a lot to digest, I know, and this is probably one of the most intricate parts of graphics hacking. 
Once we do some more of it and get more practice, however, it will become a much quicker and simpler process. Let's move on to a more colorful aspect of graphics hacking, palettes. Let's scroll through the list of palettes using the palette drop-down box. Notice how the colors are changing in the tiles section. There are 13 total palettes used for the tiles. To get a more in-depth look at what a palette consists of, click on the palettes menu item then show palette editor. A small window pops up with some color information on it. Each palette contains 16 colors, viewable by clicking on the individual squares that are shown. The colors in each palette differ depending on which game you're hacking, but as I've said before, it doesn't make a difference since the mechanics of what's going on are exactly the same throughout all Gen 3 games. Typically palettes are dedicated to specific areas within the game. For instance, palette 0 is dedicated to the green trees and brown wood that we use for outdoorsy maps. This is why it's filled with different shades of greens and browns. It's important to know that the very first color entry in every palette is dedicated to the transparent color. With one color acting as a transparency, we have 15 colors to work with in each palette. Simple enough, right? Let's take a look at some of the other palettes. We can see that palette 1 is filled with browns and grays. This palette is dedicated to things like mountains, boulders, and caves. In my own hack, I often use a browns and grays palette for wooden houses as well. Transitioning to palette 2, we can see a mix of grays, reds, and oranges. This palette is typically used for things like the roof of a Pokemon Center, doors of houses, and flower petals. Palette 3 is filled with blues and silvers and is used for things like mailboxes and the roof of a Pokemart. Hopefully you get the idea by now. You may be asking yourself how I know which tiles are used with which palettes. In order to see these relationships, simply right click on any tile in the tiles list and the palette number will automatically change to the respective palette. If we open an indoorsy map and look at the palettes, we can see that they're all changed. This is something I actually didn't realize happened since I don't have much experience with hacking indoor graphics, but I've done some digging around and found that we are indeed given 13 new palettes to work with here. I'll make sure to discuss this more if I get a hold of any more information. If you know of any quirks or interesting bits of info I could mention regarding indoor palettes or mapping, please let me know. Now that we know about palettes, we can also make an educated guess as to why some tiles in the tile list are colored weirdly. That is, some tiles use different palettes than others. When we're creating new blocks using these 8x8 tiles, we'll want to make sure that the tiles we're using in the Down Up section aren't miscolored and are in the correct palette, otherwise we'll get some strange looking graphics in our game which tends to look immature. Let's move on to a huge component of graphics, tile sets. The best way to introduce tile sets is with an exercise. Starting in Pallet Town, let's study the list of tiles available to us on the right side of the window. If we scroll through, we can see all of these nature tiles and things like the Pokemart and the Poke Center. If we scroll through the bottom of the list, we can see a cutoff transitioning from water tiles to some Pallet Town specific tiles, like the Player's House and Professor Oak's Laboratory. Now let's switch to Viridian City. Observing the tiles once again, we can see that all of the same nature tiles are there, but Pallet Town specific tiles are gone, and a new set of tiles specific to Viridian City graphics are present. Pewter City shows us the same results. This change in available tiles highlights the existence of what we call tile sets. Every map in the game is made up of two different tile sets. The numeric representation of these tile sets can be found in the header tab located at the bottom left. Tile set 1 indicates the grouping of tiles that exist first in our tile list, and tile set 2 indicates the grouping of tiles that exist second in our tile list. Knowing this, we can conclude that the representative number of the tile set that contains all of the common nature tiles is 0, and the representative number of the tile set that contains all of the Pewter City specific tiles is 3. If you search through some other maps, you'll be able to see what the representative numbers are as well. Of course, we can change which maps use which tile sets by simply changing these numbers and then clicking the Change Tile Set button. Going back to Pellet Town, let's open the block editor again. Looking in the tiles section, hopefully you now have a better idea of what's actually going on in there. Most of those jumbled tiles you see are the foundations of every coherent block that we can use in Tile Set 0, also known as the Nature Tile Set. These 8x8 tiles are drawn and placed strategically in the Down Up section in order to reduce the amount of tiles that need to actually be drawn out by hand and to make space for inserting new tiles. This is why you only see half of a tree in the tiles section, but a whole tree in the block section. 
The tree in Fire Red is perfectly symmetrical, so only half of it needs to be drawn by hand. Once we insert that half into the game, we can draw the tree out in the down up section and then use the X flip and Y flip checkboxes to simulate reflections of these tiles. Again, this technique is used so we can reduce the amount of tiles we actually have to physically draw and to free up some space for inserting additional tiles into the game. The amount of space we're given for each tile set is limited, so the use of these X and Y flips are important if you want a bunch of additional graphics available to structure your maps with. There is a dividing line between our two tile sets in the tile list, and assuming tile set 0 is the first tile set you have loaded, that line is located just underneath the four patches of grass. If you're hacking emerald, the dividing line is located just underneath the flowers. Thank goodness for these graphical landmarks, making the division between the first and second tile sets very easy to find. Everything past the final grass tile, or tile 27F if you're looking for its numeric value, is only included in whatever secondary tile set you have loaded. Once the secondary tile set is changed in the header tab, the tiles below tile 27F will change. If you're hacking emerald, this numeric value is 1FF instead. If you want to see an example of this, switch between several different maps and watch the tiles change as you transition. Since I never did actually go over how to edit blocks and palettes, I'll do that quickly. This should be a good review as well. To edit a block, click on the block you wish to edit. The tiles which it is made up of will appear in the down up section. From there, click on the tiles you want to use as part of this block in the tile section. Remember to use the correct color palette when selecting a tile. If you need to use reflections on these tiles, click the X flip or Y flip checkboxes. Obviously, the difference between checkboxes and radio buttons is that checkboxes can be clicked simultaneously, so you can flip these tiles in both directions if you need to. Finally, click the down up section where you want your tile to go. Click save and you will see the respective block change. In order to edit palettes, open the palette editor window. Using the drop down box, select the palette you wish to edit. Click on the individual colored square to be changed. This color will then be blown up so you can see the red, green, and blue sliders to modify its hue. If you hover your cursor over a color that is currently on your screen that you want to use in your palette, then press enter on your keyboard, and the select color button will be activated and the color your cursor was hovering over will then be displayed. If you know the four digit value of the color you want to use, enter it into the white box located below the blown up color and then click the 15 to RGB button and your color will be displayed. Finally, click Apply. After you're finished editing palette colors, make sure to click Write Palette Changes to ROM under the Palette menu item. It's time to move on to the final bit of block editor information, the behavior data. The behavior byte tells us how the respective tile will physically behave. You will see what I mean by this if you scroll through the list of options. Using this byte, we can specify whether our selected block shines a reflection of any character that happens to walk past it, shakes with the tall grass animation when walked through, and lots of other options. Some of the options don't give a description. Sometimes you'll come across blocks that use these behaviors so you know when to use them on any custom tiles you want to insert. An example of this is the bridge tile, which we'll get to in a future tutorial. The background byte is sort of hysterical in that I've only ever seen one value of it used. That value is 20, the only one having a proper description in the options list. This value, block is covered by hero, forces the superior or up section of tiles to act as if they were actually inferior tiles. The transparency will still work between the down and up tiles. The only thing that changes is that the player can walk in front of or on top of the superior tiles, and these tiles will not appear above the player. This is actually very helpful, and we can see its effect among a bunch of existing tiles, such as the bush, the rock, and the fence post. If you edit these values, remember to hit save in the block editor. That's everything I plan to go through in this tutorial. It was a ton of information, but in order for us to understand how tiles work to a greater degree, it had to be done. Using the information we've learned throughout this tutorial, we'll construct a very simple map using some reconstructed blocks and palettes. It's that time again for some extra information before I wrap up this video. I want to talk about the terminology between block and tile. I know I said in earlier videos that the graphics that are to the right of advanced map while in map view are called tiles, 
even though in this video we call them blocks because the term tile was devoted to the foundational 8x8 graphics in the block editor. The reason I personally use the term tile for both blocks and tiles is because I have never heard anybody say block instead of tile. In fact, in game development, there really is no such thing as a block. We could call blocks tile groupings or something of the sort. The only reason the term block exists is because Advanced Map needs a way to differentiate the fully constructed tile groupings from the foundational tiles. Whenever we're working with both tiles and tile groupings specifically, I'll do my best to use both terms. However, when we're not focusing on the intricacies, I'll be using the term tiles for everything since in context it makes sense and it's not really an issue. We will be building onto the knowledge presented in this tutorial in the next some number of tutorials as well, so the stuff we went over this time around shouldn't be pushed to the side if you're having trouble with it. At least I can say that the upcoming graphics tutorials will be much smoother now that we're done learning the foundations. We're about at the end of creating this map. Everything that went into making this map has been taught to you through this tutorial. Hopefully you all learned something valuable from this, and if you have any questions, please feel free to ask either over at Pokey Community or right here in my video's comments section. Thank you so much for being my audience, and I'll be back in the fourth installment of this series.